Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you. Happy Palm Sunday. Would y'all stand and worship with us?
Welcome to Palm Sunday. Guys, we have such an incredible service in store for you. And we're going to end it a little bit different. And because of that, what I do want to do is just take a moment here and share with you a couple things. Um, one is when you leave today, after the service, not yet, but when you leave, you're going to receive two cards. One of those is an Easter invitation, but it's not for you, okay? Let me just get this out of the way. Everybody under the sound of my voice, I am personally inviting you back to Easter next week. There you go. You're invited. So that card is for you to give away. It's to invite somebody to church next week. So hand that thing away, take a picture of it, send out some text. And I know that inviting somebody to church can be intimidating, it can be daunting. But here's what I wanna remind you. We've been talking about this for a few weeks, but Easter is one of those weeks throughout the year. Traditionally, church attendance next weekend across the world will double. There's a lot of people that don't come to church on a regular basis and they're planning to come. They're gonna, they're gonna show up at a church and they may not have a home church and that's who you wanna share that with. The second thing you're gonna do is you're gonna receive a card that's gonna tell you a little bit about uh, flowering the cross. We're pointing toward Good Friday that's coming up this coming Friday. And starting at sunrise to sunset, we're gonna put a cross right out here, right outside the west entrance of the building. And we're gonna invite you to come by at any time, you and your family or just you at any time. And we'll have flowers. And what we wanna do is we wanna flower the cross. We wanna make something beautiful out of something that really, really, really is not always that beautiful. So we wanna flower that cross. So maybe you have some flowers and you wanna bring them or you can come and we'll have flowers there and just flower the cross. And it's gonna be something special that we'll have for Easter. But in this moment, here's what I want us to do. I want us to be in Palm Sunday. And I pause for a reason. Just take a breath. Sometimes we shoot right past some of the most important days as Christ followers we need to observe. And it's our hope and our prayer that today starts something that you'll do all week long. And that is to feel and experience the power of the cross. Feel and experience the power of what Jesus did and continues to do for us. Scripture tells us that when he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, there were so many people, the crowds were, were there. And many of them took their cloaks off and they laid them on the road. Some of them cut branches and they put them on the road, creating, if you will, a red carpet, inviting the king in. Now, sure, some of them expected this warrior king. That's what you had. You, when, you, when you got a new king, it was a warrior king that was a, gonna come and defeat your oppressors. But instead of a warrior king showing up on a white stallion, you and I know who showed up. It was a lowly king who came in on a donkey. And what he was gonna do was something no king had ever done before. So the crowds pushed in and they shouted, Hosanna, which was a phrase that meant save, save us. And they were thinking in the moment, but we know he came to do again so much more. So what I want us to do in this service, in this moment, let's pray and let's just, if you will, we're gonna roll out the red carpet and invite him in. And we don't have palm branches, but maybe you just raise your hands Close your eyes. Imagine him coming in, not to Jerusalem, but right now he's coming into this place and this space that we've created for him. He's coming into your space. So Heavenly Father, we invite you in. We're so thankful that we can celebrate you and we're thankful that we can celebrate Palm Sunday, even knowing what you were headed toward, but we invite you into this place and we do praise you. We do cry out, save us, oh God. We do cry out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
you can take your seat. walks into the temple courts and he probably expected to see what you and I would expect walking into the temple prayer worship maybe someone reading maybe someone teaching but that's not what he found when he walked in what he found was greed and selfishness you know, and it's easy for me and us to read the scriptures and, and see that and point fingers in judgment. But it's always kind of been the way of humans to drift from the plan and purpose of God. And that's what had happened. Because the idea of the temple, it was supposed to be set apart, it was supposed to be holy. It had a purpose, it had a plan, and it was for the things of God. And it, it just, the people, they had drifted. But you know, after the resurrection, things changed. The temple, the building wasn't the holy and set apart thing. When at the resurrection, you and I became the temple of God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, He says this, he he said, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? He said, you're not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. So for those of us who have given our hearts and lives to Jesus, for those of us who are following the way of Jesus, he says that there's a deposit of the Holy Spirit, not only with us, but now inside of us. When Jesus found the greed and selfishness in the temple, what he did is he cleansed the temple. He removed those things that weren't supposed to be there. He eradicated them. And now we're the temple. And this is the part of the service where it's gonna get very personal. I wonder what he would say if we individually ask him, God, is there anything in this temple that you would want to remove? Is there anything in this temple that's keeping me from being the person you've called me to be? That's keeping me from realizing my potential, your desires for my life? There's a card right there near you and it's either in the seat back in front of you or the seat right next to you. Go ahead and grab that card. It looks like this. It's got Holy Week experience on one side and it's blank on the other. Grab that card and grab a pen. And here's what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to put your name on this. And 
You're not gonna hand this to a person. But what I do want you to do is be honest. And I want you to take a few moments and I want you to sit in the question and this is the question. Holy Spirit, is there anything inside of this temple that if I were to surrender it to you, you would wanna remove it from my life? And this could be a man, this, so, a secret sin. It could be a destructive habit. It could be a, a relationship, a toxic relationship that's keeping you from having the relationship with Jesus that he wants from you. It could, just, it could be so many things. And he, here's what I wanna emphasize, honesty. Because this isn't between me and you. This is between you and God. So I'm gonna get really quiet in a moment, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask that question. God, is there anything in me you would want me to surrender to you? And as he gives you those things, write every last one of them down. Some of you, it'll be one thing. Some of us, it'll be several. Earlier, God specifically showed me two things that I walked in here not thinking about. And he said, these are the two things you're to surrender today, Dale. And when you finish writing everything that he gives you, we're gonna have a moment, we've got space and we have time. Just stand up from where you are and make your way to one of the crosses here in the front and then there's one in the back. And I want you to place that card at the foot of the cross. And here's what you're doing. You're not just acknowledging, you are acknowledging by writing it. But when you lay it down, what you're doing is you're surrendering that to the Lord. And this is where we repent. This isn't where we change our behavior. This is where we change our mind. God, come in and transform my mind. We change our mind about those things. And then behaviors will follow. Many times we try to do the behavior thing first and it never works. So the question is this, Holy Spirit, is there anything in me I need to surrender today to you so that you can be all you wanna be in and through me? And when you finish writing those down over the next few moments, just stand to your feet and take it and place it at the foot of the cross.
It was Thursday night and everything about this night was wrong. It started when the disciples ascended the stairs to this upper room to have a Passover meal. They got around the table and suddenly out of nowhere, the master of the company stands up, grabs a basin of water and begins to wash the feet of every single disciple. The master doesn't do that. The lowest ranking servant does that. And if that didn't just leave them with their minds boggled enough the way it was, he got the Passover meal wrong. Now the thing is, is over the last three years, these disciples had seen plenty of new and different things out of Jesus. But Passover meal, the Passover meal they knew. They understood, they'd done it since they were little children every single year for the Passover meal. Sure, the bread was on the table, yeah, he got that right. And the wine was on the table, absolutely. But where was the lamb? You had to have the lamb on the table at Passover. Well, folks, this was a different night, a night that Jesus was going to usher something new in because on this night, the lamb would not be on the table. The lamb would be at the table and he would be ushering in a new agreement, a new covenant for you and I, a new way to approach God that could have never been fathomed before. And as Jesus is there at that table, he pulls up a chair and he invites you to do it as well. We call this moment communion. And as you came in today, you received some communion elements. I want you to take those out right now. And all together in this room, as you hold that in your hands, I want you just to go ahead and open up that top part and hold the bread in your right hand. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 not only records this Last Supper moment, but he also gives us instructions for communion and he gives us a warning because this is something sacred. It is something that was never meant to be taken flippantly or with sin in our lives. That's why it's so important that we walk through that temple cleansing moment just a second ago. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take you right to 1 Corinthians 11. And I want you to hold that bread in your right hand, but don't eat it just yet. Paul says this, for, I pa for this is what the Lord himself said, and I pass on to you just as I received it. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want you to take that bread, and I want you to break it in half right now. And the reason I'm having you do this is I don't want you to get the impression that this brokenness that scripture implies came upon Jesus was the result of some random Roman soldier 2,000 years ago. Martin Luther said it very well when he said that the nails that crucified Jesus rest in the pockets of each and every one of us every single day. It was our sin that put him on the cross. It was because of our brokenness that he allowed his body to be broken for us. And in just a moment, you'll have a second to thank him for this body that was broken for your brokenness. But in your left hand, I want you to take a look at that cup. Paul continues. He says, in the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. This cup represents the new covenant, the new agreement between God and man. This new thing that Jesus was there at the Last Supper to usher in, paid for by his blood. And it's because of his blood that we can approach a holy God. It's because of his blood that we can have relationship with a holy God who so badly wants relationship with you and I. It's because of this blood wasn't purchased cheaply, and it was purchased for you. And so across this room, I want you to close your eyes. You may be used to somebody leading you in this moment. We're, we're gonna do things just a little bit differently. In just a second, I'm going to pray for you, and then the worship team is going to begin a song. 
And while you are in your seat, I want you to have this moment between you and God. I want you in just a moment after I pray for you to take the bread and for you in a moment of thanksgiving to thank Jesus for this sacrifice. And after you've taken of the bread, I want you to take the cup and I want you to thank him for that brand new relationship, that new covenant that you can have with him. And when you are finished, you may stand and join the worship moment. So Jesus, Jesus, thank you so much for doing something so grand for such unworthy people such as us. We thank you. And in thanksgiving, we choose you. We love you. In your name, amen.
I always have to ask myself and the question I'm asking you is what's so good about Friday? What's so good about Jesus being betrayed, being unjustly sentenced? What's so good about Jesus being beaten and ultimately nailed to a cross? 
You know, just five days earlier, Jesus came into Jerusalem. And he came into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. But he didn't come just to celebrate Passover. He came to become our Passover. You see, 15 years earlier, 1,500 years earlier, and back in Exodus 12, ever since then, the Jewish people had been celebrating this holy day where as the 10th plague, and you'll probably remember the story, as the 10th plague, God rescued his people from slavery, from captivity, from bondage, from Egypt. And what happened, or really the message of that first Passover was that God is very much a holy and just God. But yet he's also a merciful God. And so 15 years or 1,500 years earlier, God had found a way to be both just and merciful. We call this salvation through substitution. Well, what happened is this, is that a family would choose a lamb They would choose a lamb based on its perfection, based on the fact that it was spotless with no blemish and no defect. They would choose a lamb and then this lamb would stay in their home with them for four days. For four days, this family would inspect and make sure that this lamb was indeed without blemish, without defect, that it was perfect. And then at the appointed time, that lamb would be killed. Its blood would be spilt. And as instructed, they would take the blood and they would paint it above the doorpost so that when God's judgment and when God's punishment for sin passed over the angel of death, the ultimate punishment is death. And when death would pass over their home, they would, death, the angel of death would see the blood over the door and would pass over that home. In other words, God's judgment and punishment would pass over that home. This is the message of Good Friday. Because no animal could ever fully and finally substitute for humanity's sin. And God knew this. God knew that this was a problem that needed to be resolved for a very long time. And God knew and planned that Good Friday was going to be the moment that that problem was resolved. When Jesus came into the city, they chose him. They chose him as king, but they also chose him as lamb. They didn't know that, but they were, they were pointing, they were picking, they were choosing their king. And then for four days, scripture tells us that he taught in the temple and the synagogue. For four days, he was found to be without blemish, without defect, to the point that they had to drum up false accusations to lie about him so that they could accuse him. He was without blemish. He was a perfect lamb. And at the appointed time, he shed his blood so that you and I would be passed over by the punishment of sin that our sin deserves. That's the message of Good Friday. I imagine that when John the Baptist prepared to baptize Jesus just before his ministry began, you can imagine that on that that, that countryside right there by the Jordan River, that as, as John the Baptist pointed out Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then just a few years after the resurrection, the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the apostle Paul said, Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. That's why we stand at Golgotha right now in this moment of wait. This is why Jesus had to be lied about. This is why Jesus had to be betrayed. This is why Jesus had to be beaten. This is why Jesus had to be nailed to a tree. This is why his blood had to flow. This is why his father had to turn his back on him. You see, Good Friday is good to us. 
but it's only good to us because it was horrific for Jesus. Because he endured unimaginable pain for you. So that that sin could be no more. So that that gap that sin caused between you and God could be no more. This is why it's so important for us on a day like today to sit and remember the cross. And not just move quickly on to the celebration of Easter, which we're so excited about But yet we need to sit in this moment and feel the deep sorrow and gratitude. There's this tension on this day where there's deep death and agony and pain, but at the same time, there's beauty and there's promise and there's hope. This is why on Friday, we are gonna flower the cross because we're gonna live in that tension of this ugly, nasty, horrible torture device. The worst that's ever been used, this ugly thing that was the cause of death and yet at the same time, we're gonna put beautiful flowers on it because we're gonna look at the beauty that came from that sacrifice. We live today in that tension. This is why Good Friday is good. But the question I have for you is this. Has his blood been applied to your life? Because in Exodus 12, it wasn't just that they spilled the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb had to be applied to the doorpost of the home. It's not just that Jesus spilled his blood. The good news about the spilt blood of Jesus is that every single one of you, whether whether that blood is applied or not, your sins have been forgiven. But you do not accept that until his blood is actually applied to your life. So the question is, has his blood been applied to your life? Have you surrendered your life? Have you you made a faith step, a faith statement to put your hope, your trust, your faith in him? Have you accepted his forgiveness? And before we leave in just a few minutes, our ministry team is gonna be here. And if today you say, you know what? I've been doing the church thing for a long time or maybe I'm brand new to this whole thing and I've not made that step, then I invite you today There's no better day than today to accept Jesus Christ in your life. So at the end, in just a few minutes, I would invite you down and pray with someone. Come down and let us lead you, pray with you, and help you begin this journey of applying his blood to your life and then living that out. But I don't want us to rush to the celebration of Easter. I feel like it's so, for me personally, in my own soul, it's so good for me to sit in this moment to feel, to feel what Jesus Christ, who was perfect in every way, who did not deserve death, but he took death for you who deserve death. And he took that upon himself. So I want us to just sit in the goodness of Friday. I want us to sit in the goodness of the crucifixion of what Jesus did for us. I'm gonna do that by reading Isaiah 53. And here's what I want you to do while I read is I'm going to invite you, not yet, but in in just a moment, I'm going to have you close your eyes. And I want you just to allow your imagination to run free. And honestly, I want to allow the Holy Spirit to infuse your imagination as we read this passage. And after I'm done reading, I'll be finished. And I'm going to challenge you to just sit in this moment as long as you need to sit in this moment. You can sit, you can worship, you can come down for prayer if you need prayer. My, my, my request is that as you leave the room, I ask that you leave the room in silence. So that this, 
this sanctuary just stay still and quiet and peaceful as we sit in the heaviness of this moment. So do this. Go ahead and close your eyes. And I'm going to read this passage. And again, I want you to allow your imagination to just run, visualize, picture, feel, feel what he did for you. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing that would attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal and he was put in a rich man's grave. Sin 
had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.